Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Justin. I'm uh, going to be learning as I go along, just so we're all clear on that, because I've got some hyperlinks embedded in my PowerPoint, so bear with me as we navigate this, um, this little uh, session today. So let me see if I can get it in PowerPoint mode. Nope. Talk to me, Justin. Wrong, wrong click. Wrong oh, it's because I'm a Mac. There we go. We're on a PC. There we go. All right. So today we're going to talk about seven things that I found in my research uh, in how to humanize or bring the human element and use that into online teaching and learning. And that might be anything from your presence to getting students engaged with each other or even taking them down that cognitive rabbit hole of sorts um, so that they can go deeper in their own exploration of the content, which can be messy and difficult in part. Um, so all good stuff. So a little background about me. Um, I used to, when I grew up, I wanted to work at Disney. So I thought this was the best picture to represent me. Um, I am just a big kid. I taught first grade for many years before I ended up in digital learning. That kind of, I was fixing other people's computers, and that's kind of what had me go down this path. Um, but I've been building online programs for universities since 2005. And so been on this journey of digital learning and exploration of the tools and how we can use those to enhance the student experience for quite a while. Um, I was very fascinated with the MOOC craze. The timing of the MOOC happenings were all aligned with my doctoral work. So I started building and exploring in the MOOC space and found that as a really interesting incubator for research ideas. And so the human MOOC, or Humanizing Online Teaching and Learning, is a course that I designed in 2013 that's now been taught, oh, five times. And, um, and the last time it was taught, it was actually an Educause badged course from the Educause Learning Initiative. So that's been a fun adventure. Um, Matt Crossland, who works here in the Link Lab, uh, actually used the human MOOC as the story for his dissertation. So you may have heard some of these stories previously. Um, but a fantastic opportunity to play and explore and learn. Um, I am the co-founder and chief academic officer at a company called iDesign, which is here based in Dallas. Uh, we assist universities in going online. Uh, we do that in a fee-for-service, unbundled service solution model. You're probably familiar with the bundled rev share approach to serving higher education. That they call it online program management. Um, we're more of online program enablement. <laughs> so we want to help everybody build the capacity they need and then slowly step away as you build that capacity and maybe help you build the next thing and, and move on down the road. Um, and, and like I said, my concern has really been about the student experience. As a mother of four, I have three children that are now college-aged. Ouch. And so I'm learning through their eyes and their lens what the world looks like as young people going off to college. I mentioned iDesign, so these are just a few of the partners that we work with, just so you understand who we're working with. Um, and, uh, and really, I think it's... It's a mixture of really innovative, like a, a Southern New Hampshire who's doing a lot of competency-based education, the Mayo Clinic, uh, really one of the last fields to leverage blended learning is medical education and legal education. We work with Emory's Law School. Um, so a lot of really creative, innovative partners. Um, some of the solutions that we've put together, um, like at the University of Mizzou, uh, we built their K-12 experiences that were being served up in Vietnam and Korea and Brazil. So we, we're doing some really creative and, and innovative work. So as I was preparing the slides for today, um, I was reminded of my daughter's performance in The Cripple of Anishman. That is my daughter. I always like to use real pictures, so I don't have to use um, Creative Commons and all that, right? I took that picture, or a friend of mine took that picture, and, um, and I was thinking about how human, how that touching portrayal of care and thoughtfulness comes across on their faces, that there's something genuine there, and they're actors. Right? <laughs> we do a really good job of taking care of our students when we're face-to-face, -face, and I think we can do just as good of a job of taking care of our students when they're virtual. But we need a way to connect like that, that's, uh, that's real and, and resonates with everybody. So. The focus on humanizing is really to help counteract the distance and distance learning, to personalize the experience, to make it more relevant, and to leverage the technology tools. Because I, I mentioned I have been designing online programs for, what's it been, 14 years now. 
the technology has changed so significantly just in the amount of time I've been working in this space that you can now have this real time face to face conversation with somebody and see the emotion and to respond to people in real time when you can see their face even thousands of miles apart. I have conversations with colleagues on the other side of the planet and can see and hear them in real time. That's <coughs> transformational for the work that we do. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about the teaching and learning. We're thinking about the process that needs to unfold for students and for us and choosing the right tool for the job. Oftentimes we pick the tool first and think we can bend it to make it do what we want. And we've got to flip that paradigm and make sure we're making the right tool selections. So, um, so here's the background on the human MOOC. I mentioned before it had been taught four different times and that it was offered by Educause, but really it was about using the community of inquiry as a model for teaching and learning as the foundation. And then each of the modules went deeper into how you could use technology to support that. So the first module was really more of a getting started, exploration of some tools, ways we could connect. The second module focused just on instructor presence. So how could you use voice, video, um, video and discussion forums to introduce yourself, video introductions to help increase instructor presence in an online course? And then how do you take it to that next level? with social presence, and how do you get your students going and engaged and move that forward? And then the final module was really cognitive presence and taking them deeper. And we had guest speakers like Jim Groom, who would talk about when the professor went missing in Digital Storytelling 106, and the whole goal of Digital Storytelling DS106 was to create these digital assets, GIFs and pictures and animations, and so the animations and pictures and gifts that the students were creating were about this missing instructor, his face on the side of a milk carton, right? So how can you use something transformational to help take the students down a path with, which allows them to be more creative? Um, so the purpose of the most recent research study that we've been working on behind the scenes is impact of practice. So in education research, we don't often get to the tree fell in the forest and what noise did it make? So the study we've been doing recently is asking people who were in the MOOC over the last several years, what did they apply in their own teaching and how did it, how did it make a difference? What happened? And so we've collected their stories and their experiences and are writing that up currently. Um, we've got a draft almost ready to be submitted for publication. Super exciting stuff, but it's, the book research we've seen has all been about completion rates, right? Not about the people who did actually listen and apply something that they learned. So I'm really excited to be able to tell this story. And so now we're going to see if this works. <laughs> so bear with me. This was the audio challenge we were having a moment ago. Um, there is this lovely YouTube link, and let's see. Um, is Chrome best, Justin? Doesn't matter. Okay. Right. Screen sharing is paused. Yeah, let's switch that. That's bringing the Zoom link over. Oh. Yeah. Pull that over into. So, Kathy, I'm so glad you were able to join us, um, and I appreciate you running as fast as you did to be able to make it. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if um, you could explain your story. Um, you've told it to me before, but your story about uh, what human movement for you the first time we taught it, or we were in it together. When I uh, first encountered Human MOOC, it was through a webinar that Michelle Piancy Brock had given, and she kind of was plugging it, and it just so happened at that very time, I was in a class on leadership and online education, and the professor disappeared. 
He was um, not responding to our inquiries. He was not grading things. He was not um, communicating with us in any way. And we as students had to decide what we were going to do about it. And um, we just really stuck together and made decisions about how we were going to work things out. And uh, it worked out. It, it, it just proved to me the value of the human MOOC um, course and, and what we were, were going through. When, uh, when we were finished, uh, of course, we had already talked to somebody about this situation, but um, I really pushed the human MOOC principles that I had learned through this course with uh, my other professors. That's interesting you mentioned that. Yeah, so it's, it's fascinating. Some of the people that found us, right, were these folks that were starved. They actually were wanting to learn and didn't have the, uh, the ability or the opportunity to do so. Um, could you bring us back to the PowerPoint? There we go. So Kathy's story is not 100% unique. So we had a couple of other people who shared antidotes of a lack of communication or a lack of collaboration, that it was very much in their typical online learning environment, that it was consume content and produce or take a quiz or a test. And they wanted something more than that. So that if the students are asking for it, right, that the, kind of our hypothesis was we should figure out ways to give it to them. Um, yeah. So we truly focused on experiences. What did we want to design? How did we want to reach folks? And what technologies did we want to bring to the table? And, and one of our research outputs from this impact to practice study came down to some of the tools that we employ that I'll share with you today. Um, we actually have a piece of our write-up that we're doing right now that we're calling the broken bridge. Because we brought tools to the table that other people across the globe at all these different universities all over the world didn't have support for in-house. So one of the pieces of this puzzle is not just the right technology, but also the right supported technology. And I mentioned earlier, let's focus on teaching and learning before we pick a tool, but also choose a tool that's supported by your institution, because otherwise there can be this technical challenge. Um, again, using a, a photo that I took myself. So my, my darling, youngest is starting color guard. She's a freshman at Claremont High School. And when I think about this quote from this student in the student group and the fact that it gave them confidence, right? They had a safe place to practice. They were, uh, they were surrounded by their peers and colleagues, other people who teach in online, and they weren't in front of their students. They had a safe place where they could start exploring and practicing. And, uh, and so I often think of just the confidence that she's building in high school, right? And it's, it's the same thing, regardless of how old you are. You want to be able to practice with your colleagues and your peers before you go try it out in your own classroom. So Human Mood created that safe space for people to try things. And uh, let's see, here's, here's what they said. I think you tell students we're trying this, or this is the time I've done this. As long as I was trying to do something with the goal being to humanize my class, to make it more real and relevant and engaging. We did have a couple of folks that we interviewed who said that as they were trying new things, they actually told their students they were trying new things, and their students felt like they were empowered to assist them in being successful, which was also really powerful. So some of us need the safe space to incubate and think and try first. Others are, are more, I'll say, um, um, apt to give it a go, <laughs> okay with trying something new and, and living on the edge of something more innovative or, or, and letting the students also help steer the ship. So depending on your comfort level, that works. Um, so the community of inquiry, have all of you run across the community of inquiry in your practice before? I know you have a whole <laughs> career, right? <laughs> so Peggy, maybe you take over at this point. Um, so the, the fundamental model that the whole course was built on was the community of inquiry as a model for teaching and learning. It's been around a long time. It's tried and tested face-to-face -face and online. This comes from some really wonderful researchers at Athabasca University, where most all, you know, most innovation comes from, right? 
our friends to the north. And, um, and it's focused on instructor presence or teaching presence, I called it, because every time I said instructor presence, it got confused, or no, I said instructor presence, teaching presence gets confused because it's like you're supposed to teach it. So, um, so we called it an instructor. But it's, just, it's this combination of pulling together, having enough teaching presence that you establish the tone for the course, you form storm norm, you start to move things forward, but knowing how to pull back on teaching presence so that social presence can actually happen because if you bring too much of yourself to discussion forums to the conversation with the, with the students they won't actually engage socially they'll start to pull back and defer to you so there's a certain amount of that that has to happen and then as they start to take on projects they go deeper into the, the work that needs to be done there's a delicate balance between checking in giving enough support and feedback and pushing them to go deeper when you know they can. And I think we all do that really well with feedback to students. So what we explored was how can we do that feedback differently <coughs> utilizing the tools of today. So um, the course over time changed a few times, as happens. Uh, we, we taught it five times. It had to change. We had to touch it. Um, so we started with the uh, data from the 2013 course. Um, we used the community of inquiry framework, and then we layered on the Penn State pedagogical competencies for online teaching success. If you're not familiar with those, those are a great resource of information uh, for any of you that are looking for another you know, avenue or track to discover, and brought those together. And what we looked for was ways to tie the objectives with the weekly activities and the assessments so we could badge the individual pathways. So in the first iteration of the course, we didn't know what that looked like, but by version two, we were ready to deploy these badged pathways. If you'll forward. So this was taking every learning outcome and aligning it across some of the Penn State pedagogical competencies for online teaching success. And we cherry picked the ones that made the most sense without having to add another 26 competencies to the course. And then looked for places, did a little crosswalk alignment of where those um, Pedagogical competencies were actually met with the different learning objectives in the course. Yes, ma'am. I just wonder if you're using pedagogy, but it, your audience space is adults, right? So is there a reason why you didn't use pedagogy? Um, it's a good question. They are adult learners, but uh, I think it's just a mental block on my part because I started in first grade. <laughs> so, um, also, when you go to look for the Penn State competencies, they're called pedagogical competencies. It's how it's, it's actually how it's published. Like they're different. We, we, we draw on different things as adults. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Did you want to jump in? I was going to say, I think pedagogy sort of become like a catch-all term. Oh, is it? Um, yeah. I mean, I know Matt is on the call, too. We can talk about it afterward, too. No, There's, no, no, I mean. Yeah, but, we've had a little number of discussions about that, but I think pedagogy is sort of that. It's like you're thinking about the way. That, okay, yeah. thank you. Because in you know, some disciplines, you you have to show that shift, otherwise they go, we're not children. Yes. Right. And and so it's good to hear that it's an overall framework. Thank you. It is. Sir. It is. Yeah, and it, it tends to be a catch-all, and you'll see it used across the board. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. They're not called the Penn State Andragogical Competencies. So. Yeah. Yeah. But anyhow, you'll take us forward one more. So then, then after aligning the objectives with the Penn State Competencies, we took those same um, criteria and took the outcomes for the course and looked for the places where the activities in the course aligned to those items and then decided what was required in order for badges to be earned. So it was a great way of making sure, double checking ourselves, that we were putting things together in a way that was really meaningful so the badges had value. Um, that's the funny thing about badges is sometimes they don't mean anything, right? They're for completion and that's not necessarily completion you can get to by clicking through something sometimes. So we wanted it to have value and meaning. Um, so badges. <laughs> badges all by itself is another topic we could spend days and weeks and hours on, but um, uh, Kyle Bowen at Penn State University, he used to be at Purdue, I think when he produced this graphic, um, it, it really clearly helped us think about what were the criteria, what were the pieces of a badge that you needed to have in place. And this is really what spurred our thinking about what those components of success were that would go into those individual badges. So for the human MOOC, we badged instructor presence or teaching presence, 
So we, we badged social presence and we badged cognitive presence. And if you got all three, you got the community of inquiry badge. That made sense because you have to have all three, right, to understand the community of inquiry. But then that way, folks could snack, right? So we know in MOOCs, we have lurkers, we have, I don't know, I call them snackers, people that just kind of want to come and look and maybe just get a flavor of something. And so then that way, if somebody just wanted to focus on social presence, that was perfectly fine. Um, some of our conversations are interviews about what did badges motivate you? The answer is no. Across the board, almost everybody said no. And then a few minutes later, they'd say, but I really wanted the badge. <laughs> right? so, so it's kind of funny how that comes up in conversation, um, which I found was a really interesting takeaway. But moving on, badges are not the whole mission here today. Oh, whoa, no. <laughs> Will you go ahead and click one more time? Yeah. It really does fit on the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> it just shows the different activities. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Look at that. Yeah, it fits, I promise. <laughs> but not once it goes from a Mac to a PC. Okay. Really? Yeah, it's really cool, though. It just shows you what the students had to do in order to earn each of those badges. <laughs> no worries. Okay. So then, no, they weren't motivated to get badges, right? But then we had all these folks that were not only getting the badges, they were also publishing them places, right? So this is um, Donnie. She took the course, obviously, right? Because she's in here and she has every single badge. We give a research participant badge for folks who wanted to be involved in the ongoing research. Um, but she, she received all of the other badges as well. So I think one of our interesting conversations was with um, Adam Kroom, who I think has visited here as well. He's yes. at OU in Norman, Oklahoma. And he wrote me and said, I can't publish my badge to LinkedIn. And I learned a Craigslist glitch, right? All my good learning comes from things that are broken. Uh, you can't have a hashtag in the badge name. And it was something that simple. But just the idea that somebody was struggling, trying to, pr trying to publish these badges to LinkedIn, just kind of cool to figure out. So uh, we have this version of the badges, which this is on Credly, somebody actually showcasing what they've done. And then there should be, yeah, here you go, on LinkedIn, where now we're seeing all of these badges show up on LinkedIn as well. So what started as just a little thought experiment and some research turned into something that people were proud to share their accomplishment about. So. What do we have next, Justin? Oh, okay. So um, bringing it back to the classroom, so this gets into our um, research into the impact of practice, right? And one of the big takeaways for us was just keeping it simple. I, I felt like it's some, you know, sometimes you scratch your head and you go, am I oversimplifying things? But keeping it super simple and referring back to the work of Anderson and Garrison and Archer and just taking a step back and using the community of inquiry as a framework actually helped people make sense of all these things, right? It just made it really straightforward. Um, so it was all about trying to figure out ways they could engage with their students and increase social presence. Um, oh, and there's a book. So it, one of our many projects as an output of this class was um, I put out a call for chapters for the folks that were in the course. Um, I brought a handful of them with me, um, but um, this is an open educational resource. It's available at humanmoot.pressbooks.com. Human so you're welcome to have it, use it, whatever you'd like. Um, it is available on Amazon. All proceeds go to DigiHead Lab. You may be familiar with their work. They produce hybrid pedagogy um, and do a summer conference every year out in, um, what is it, University of Mary Washington. Um, but chapters written in the context of the individuals themselves. We have a chapter from Mahavali in Egypt. One from Ludvilla, who's in Russia, telling the story of applying these practices in a business course. So it's just case studies from different people trying to humanize their own courses all over the world. Um, pretty interesting read if you've got the time. So I borrowed this slide from work because I think this is where we are pedagogically at this point in time, or um, from a design perspective, I'll say, instead of pedagogically. Um, what we're often trying to do at the beginning of any project is really kind of understand the students, get grounded in what their needs are and where we can actually make a difference, because that's what we all got into this business for, is to make a difference. Um, we help define what that solution set looks like, 
And then we've got to go and look for the best of the open web, the best open educational resources and bring those to bear before we go and build things from scratch anymore. Um, the web is vast. And so many people have done so many wonderful things, right? So we, we should build upon that body of knowledge. Then we start developing things and testing them. And I think, I think the real magic happens on this side of the line, because I don't think of this as learning on the part of the students. I think of this as learning on the part of the faculty, too. And that evolution of what we do, I mean, that's something that I think, I think back on the human MOOC experience. Each time we taught it, we tried to bring something new to the table to explore and to challenge ourselves, much less the participants. And that, that iteration on design allows us to try new technologies, new methods, new ways of reaching students. So that's really where the magic seems to happen. And then I love this because don't we always <laughs> um, design one way and it goes another. So that iteration is really powerful in, in order to allow us to continually update, change, and, and modify. Um, and then, of course, if you put technology first, you might be doing it wrong. I think that boating one is my favorite. Yeah. Although Facebook does remind me of my grandfather. Um, so here are seven takeaways from today. And some of these you may already be doing. Some of these may be new ideas. Um, you can put them in the magic eight ball, shake them up, and see which one actually stimulates your thinking. But we're going to talk a little bit about establishing instructor presence, like trying to use video in your online teaching. I think you've heard a lot of that from Peggy. I see what she's staring. Um, connect with your students before class. Something as simple as an early announcement or email that goes out to get them engaged. We'll start that instructor presence and social presence piece pretty early. Using video discussions, you're getting ready to move to Canvas, or some of you already are moving to Canvas. You'll see that the video tools inside Canvas they can be used anywhere content can be created, can be pretty powerful, um, pretty low tech. I do a lot of grading from my iPad using SpeedGrader and using voice and video comments are great. <coughs> using student blogs as publishing. So um, if you're a writing instructor or uh, someone who has students creating a lot of content, using those blogs for the students to start creating a space where they, they share that writing collectively is very powerful. Um, using podcasting, both for students and instructors, can be that takeaway from today. Um, and voice and video feedback on assignments, which I mentioned. And then th this one, so I used to only say six, but this one has been really helpful for me. I teach at the University of North Texas in um, a master's degree course in instructional design in, in the learning technologies program. And pre-planning my communications is something that I started to put together for next semester. Um, I'm not there yet, but it's this idea that I'm noodling that I think will help me going forward. So I'll go ahead and share with you what that looks like too. So I'm ready to jump in. Oh, <laughs> another great use of a theater kit. So um, yeah, that's a lot of things to try to take on. So don't try to bite off all seven <laughs> ideas today. Um, <clears throat> I see that case all the time. All right, so now Dr. Chuck shares a story about instructor video. If we can grab that. Thank you. It's only about a minute and a half long. Oh. I think they're live. Oh, I think we've got to start at nine something. Yeah. yeah. Is it nine? Yeah, nine. <coughs> oh, oh, until 9.40. So it it's for learning something. It took me about a year ago. Perfect. So I was having so much fun, and the, and the, and the uh, that you just showed was me in the studio. We built the, the studio, and people filming me, and I, I, they were using my software to produce all the media, and it was just the funnest thing in the world. And, and, and then at some point, I got good at it, and the class was good, and the students were learning something. It took me about a year and a half to get the class right, but the third time I did it, and then I realized, like, crap, this isn't so fun anymore. It wasn't fun making it, but it wasn't fun just running it because I never saw the students. And um, I, 
because I was so freaked out that they were so happy and I wasn't on the <laughs> midterm exam. And um, I thought, I want to see my students. So I was forced to face to face midterm exam. All my students were on campus at this time. I just wanted to make a stream it on campus. I really wasn't outreaching because it was a four credit class, a class for credit. And um, so I said, you have to come to it as if that was a security thing. I didn't care about the security. And then it got worse when I gave that exam because they walked in and they already knew me. They knew my jokes, they knew my personality, they knew everything because I put that all into the class and I didn't know them and I felt really bad because I didn't know them and they, were, they felt I should know them, right? And that was the last time I ever taught that class. Yeah. So one of the other stories he shares, um, it, it's fascinating to hear him tell the story of not knowing his students and bringing them in. But one of the other stories he shares, because he's been doing video for a really long time, um, as a matter of fact, he was kind of the first person to ever do video on the web. Um, but one of the stories is all about the difference between Jimmy Kimmel, is it Kimmel or Fallon that challenges people? Does anybody know or care? No? Okay. So it's the, it's the guy, I don't even know. But one of those Jimmys that does late night talk shows, um, he talks about the difference between that guy who always challenges everybody and has to be better than them. He sings with them, and he's always trying to win. Is it Fallon? Okay. Um, versus being Johnny Carson. He said Johnny Carson was just this really approachable guy. He made mistakes. He said things that were silly. He let animals crawl all over his head. He was real. He'd drink his coffee and talk to people. He said, that's who I want to be. I don't want to challenge people to be better than them or to show them that I'm smarter than them. I just want to be real. I just want to connect with students and make a difference. And I thought that really, that for me really resonated tremendously as well. So uh, one of the things about doing a course like this was it gave us an opportunity to talk to all these really cool people. Um, we would schedule weekly Google Hangouts that were focused on either instructor social or cognitive presence and bring in guest speakers from all over. You probably recognize Matt. Matt, wave to yourself. Um, <laughs> I think he's on remotely. Um, but, um, but we had the opportunity to really get to know some of these individuals that are doing incredible work in our space. So it was a great adventure to be on the side of creating this and putting this together for other people at the same time. It was just super awesome to hear the student feedback and the research that we've been doing. Um, then if we'll go forward. Okay, so here we go. Announcements, email, or video welcome. So this is the second piece. The first one was do a little video. Introduce yourself. Be authentic. Be real. Let your cat jump up on your lap. Drink your coffee. Be Johnny Carson, not Jimmy Kimball. Okay. Fallon. Okay. Um, but the other is to, to introduce yourself and your course early <coughs> and to get your bluff in. Right, as my husband says with the kids, as we were raising the hurry up and get your bluff in. She's almost two, you know. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's really helpful to give them some hyperlinks, some things to read, some things to explore. Your type A students that are positive, they're going to get an A in your class. Will appreciate all the extra opportunity they have to be ahead of everybody else because <laughs> that's all they want. And then your folks that maybe are a little bit slower to get online, maybe they don't even have their book yet, or they just registered yesterday, it gives them a way to wade in the deep end of the pool before the course actually begins. So if you can get this out a week or two before the course even starts, depending on when you know your students are in that class, that can be incredibly helpful to set the tone. Um, I also embedded video in that announcement, and so I actually wrote the announcement and then recorded it, so then it was ADA compliant. Um, yeah, you're welcome to watch it. There you go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Move and Move. I'm Whitney Kilgore, one of your course uh, educators and a PhD student in learning technology oh, at the University of Colorado. I'm joined by Dr. Robin. I was um, making my soft voice kind of Maha <laughs> And the four of us will serve as your course wayfinders or your guides on the side for the next four weeks. We're glad you've joined us. The course focuses on the community of inquiry framework, but is also aligned with many of the Penn State pedagogical competencies for online teaching. 
There are a couple of different ways you can participate in the course as well. You certainly can participate out on the open web using Twitter and Google communities and blogs. But you can also participate on the campus. Okay. We don't have to watch the whole thing. And okay. within that space. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I don't really, it's kind of weird to watch it somewhere. <laughs> yes. My office doesn't even look like that anymore. <laughs> um, so, um, so the great thing was, from an ADA compliance standpoint, because every time we record video now, we have to think about this, right? Um, I was able to write what I wanted to say, record the video, and in Canvas, in the announcements function, Put the text in. I could put the video in the middle and the rest of the text afterwards, um, but the text was all there. So it was fine for anybody who needed that alternative transcript version. Um, I didn't have anybody that uh, said that they needed it, but it's always important to do that anyway. Um, but sending that out through the announcements about a week before the course started had people then, and in Canvas, you could open your announcements up where they become a discussion forum. So it had people posting, so excited, looking forward to the course, letting them start to build that social piece in Canvas before the course starts on the announcement itself can also be another way that you can get people engaged. Um, okay, so video discussions. So in our Impact of Practice conversations, we had someone who said that they couldn't believe how many people they met, people they already knew from digital learning communities in this video-based discussion forum. So that was kind of cool for them. In my own class that I teach at UNT, we do the same thing. We have a video-based introduction discussion forum. So at the beginning of a class, I like for folks to be able to introduce themselves. However, if you do a video-based discussion introduction at the beginning of every or at the beginning of every course in a program of study, that can get tedious, right? So um, I would say as a program, you want to look at mixing it up. There's lots of icebreaker ideas that you could share across a program or study across the faculty so that each of those introductions is somehow different or unique. Having been in a couple of programs myself, I can tell you, when all you do is introduce yourself, you start getting good at keeping it in a Word doc and copying and pasting it in the next semester, right? So, um, so look for ways as a program or a department to be creative so that those aren't repetitive. And if you do, yes? No, no, go ahead. So there's this, just next to what you're saying, but it's, it's a little cool. There's this debate about high-end versus low-end real-world video production quality. Yeah. So when doing something like this, uh, you know, a lot of us have no budget to go in, walk the webcam on, yeah. or even do cell phones. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? So, um, this is recorded for all posterity. I think MOOCs have done a wonderful disservice um, to online education by making people think that they have to have Hollywood-style video in order for learning to occur. Um, if, if we watched all of Dr. Chuck's interview, which you can go back to on YouTube, um, he talks about the importance of being authentic and real in the video the cat jumping on his lap and picking up his cup of coffee. And he's on Coursera. He has taught, I don't know, over a million students already. And his videos are high quality in the way we would think high quality. But his students feel they're high quality because they meet their needs and they resonate with that. So um, I actually think, you know, professional dress in your home office, um, all of that is just fine. Cup of coffee or water or whatever your jam is just fine. Um, I actually even think when people go to the trouble to edit out interruptions, but sometimes that seems not real, right? Not authentic, like something happened and I missed it. Um, yeah, so I would, I would say your students are going to resonate with you being you. I that came in peace. Parents and one of mine that was voice over, that was voicing over something. Yeah. And so after students always emailed me about the cat, I started just posting the picture of the cat. Nice. Because I always got five or six emails. Was that a cat? Nice. So, cat Did you hear that, Peggy? The cat is getting rave reviews. My students know my dog. Yeah, yeah. Dexter <laughs> needs to be famous, <laughs> right? I mean, he should be in all the videos. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, the, the idea of having video-based discussions can be really powerful. You have that ability in Canvas because in content areas you can have the students use the little video tool 
So it's that little thumbnail with the play button on it or whatever. Um, but there is another tool that's called Flipgrid. And if you want to advance, I think that's, yeah, so never mind. Here's, um, here's the one in Canvas. So I actually have them use the little film strip icon on the WYSIWYG toolbar and do the recording of the video in the discussion in Canvas. And we did this in the human MOOC as well. But then if you'll go forward, Flipgrid is a tool that I absolutely love because it's mobile friendly. Um, it does its own uh, text-based alternative transcript, so it'll automatically generate that for you too from an ADA compliance standpoint. And Microsoft purchased Flipgrid in July of last year, I believe, and so they've made it free for teachers forever. It's kind of their way of giving back to the teacher community and hopefully selling, I think, Office 365. Yes, we think that's what you're doing. Um, and, uh, but it's a fabulous tool, very engaging. Students tend to love it. And depending on whether or not you're in teacher education, anybody in teacher education, in teacher ed, Flipgrid's taking off like a firestorm in K-12. Oh, I've heard that uh, teachers are totally interested in yeah. yeah, the kids absolutely love it. Yeah. It's an app for iPad, iPhone, Android, but it's also a web-based application that you can embed right in any page in any LMS. So that's in Microsoft Teams, so we have that out there for since all of our students have Teams. There you go, and it sounds like it's probably supported because it's a Microsoft tool. Um, so I love it for that reason. Um, if you'll skip forward, um, so this is actually in the human MOOC. So this is a screenshot of the participants leaving their stories of how they implemented different social learning practices in their own courses. And so I described a quick screenshot. It's really phenomenal when you can just click through and hear all the stories that the different people have to say about how they're creating these social learning experiences. So that's always, I love this tool for that reason. And, um, and then here's the transcript piece, right? So um, Sue's response, it, it came in and it automatically generated the transcript. And then you can go in and you can actually kind of go in and edit it. If it doesn't capture something correctly, sometimes it's um, pronunciation, sometimes it's an accent, but certain things will pick up wrong, right? It happens when it's machine created. But, but I, I found that to be really helpful um, in order to make sure that things are accessible. But of course, it's mobile friendly too. So there is an app for it, and you can launch it right from your phone. So as long as you know the Flipgrid code, you can actually be walking around and talking and doing that, which is kind of nice. Um, I recorded one of my questions outside on the back porch, you know, just to have a different surrounding. So I've got the pond behind me, and it's just you know less officey. So all right, moving on to number four. Wow, we're we're almost out of time, Justin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so blogs and student voice. Um, I will give a shout out to Laura Gibbs, who was a big part of the humanizing course, is very well known in the blogosphere. She's a writing instructor at OU in um, Norman, Oklahoma, but she hails from North Carolina. But fabulous individual in having her students start to share their work collectively and having the students comment on each other's blogs so that their writing can continuously improve. Um, if you don't know her, she is Online Course Lady on Twitter, if you want to follow her. Um, she uses a tool called Inner Reader to embed her blogs in Canvas. You may want to write this one down. It's worth your time in exploring, um, but it allows you to automate that blog role right in your Canvas page with some embed code. Everybody's got it written down? Okay. All right. Um, oh, and she does say that she's happy for people to contact her with any questions. <laughs> so um, if you are connected with her on Twitter, you run into any trouble using Interreader, she's there for you to, to reach out to and support. And Justin and Matt probably love Interreader and are helpful in that regard as well. All right. One of the other tools that I liked for blogging and sharing blogs, and this gets used more so in the K-12 space than it does in higher ed, is a tool called Symbolu. And it creates this kind of dashboard effect. These are all the blogs that people wrote on the human MOOC or wrote during the time they were learning about the human MOOC. And so we dropped those into Symbolu. So then it becomes a launch pad, so you can click any of those buttons and go straight to that person's blog. So when you start thinking about how you want to bring all that together in your own course, that's another tool other than inner reader that might be useful to you. And um, for those of you that were K-12 
centric in the back of the room, you may know <coughs> that one. Uh, quite popular in the K-12 space. All right, and then blogging in general. So I grabbed a few screenshots from some of the blogs that people wrote during the course. Um, and I, I do love, I'll share the slides just so you can share them out, but I do love hearing the stories of the individuals that are starting to get, get engaged in the course. And, uh, and I know exactly who this one is, right? So Helen DeWart's blog is at the bottom. You can click that link and go and see all of her learning. She's very good about making her learning visible. Um, how is week one going? Um, I need to take an online class if I want to teach an online class. That was one of her big takeaways, which I liked. Um, and she wanted to figure out if online teaching was really what she wanted to do. So we get to the why, which was kind of fun. Okay, number five. Five, six, seven. We can do three in five minutes, can't we? Okay. <laughs> Podcasting, vodcasting, and blogging. So um, I think you've got a champion for that right here in the room. I know uh, Peggy has an extensive background in this space. We did YouTube channel with how many views now? Like two, almost two million. But there's really it's been haphazard. So I'm thinking if I can be more strategic and professional just a little bit, I can have to do much more with it. There you go. So keep an eye on Peggy. She's going nowhere but up from here with two million views. Um, podcasting can have a variety of different looks and feels. So it doesn't always have to be podcasting to get on the iTunes podcast list, right? It can just be podcasting for your students in your course. So this is an example of a podcast that's embedded right in a course in Canvas, just using SoundCloud as the tool. So that's one really easy way that you can just create an audio file on your phone and then upload it and share it in your course. Then having students create podcasts is even more compelling. I love students as producers. So think about ways you might engage your students in creating a podcast about what they're learning in the class. Even if it's just a reflective activity where each week they're, they're creating one three-minute segment to talk about what they learned this week, at least it gets that reflective practice down for them. And then one of the things that magically happened um, during the course as we were going through it, I think this was like the third time, um, is social learning started happening on its own on Hangouts. We had been modeling this and doing this with thought leaders and others, bringing them to the conversation to come talk to us about particular topics. And then all of a sudden, the participants, without any of the facilitators or any of the um, presenters coming together, the students started having their own Google Hangouts to talk about what they were learning. Maybe that's something you could encourage in your own class, is to get your students getting together on a weekly basis. Maybe you're not having a synchronous meeting every week, or you are, but maybe they are. Just them together, because all learning is a conversation, or at least that's what Lorelai said, right? If they're only talking to themselves, then that conversation is happening in their head without thoughts from others. So think of ways you could get your students to begin to have those conversations together. Um, and this is another example where Amy led one. Um, Amy's at, uh, she's in North Carolina at the University of uh, Wilmington, North Carolina Wilmington, and led one of these get-togethers with the group trying to share their stories. And then this video um, is really long, <laughs> so we won't do this. We'll keep going. But if you want to hear the stories from the participants themselves, this is just stitched together uh, several minutes of different stories from different participants. OK, so six and seven, still to go. Voice and video feedback. So in your speed grader in Canvas, you will have a couple of new options. Um, one is voice and video feedback, where you could just record live. I, I use an iPad for grading. Do you guys have iPads here as a part of your tools through the school? You have one. Yeah. So um, you can do it from your laptop as well. You can click the little button for voice and video. And it will also has one now where you can click, and it will capture your voice, and it will write your message back to your students. So it makes commenting go really fast. Yeah. It's fabulous. Speech to text yeah. version. So there's that, and then um, if you're using the iPad, you can actually mark up their papers in the viewer right there. Um, I always change it from red to green before I mark them up. I don't know why the default is red, but um, you know I was a first grade teacher, so you don't use red ink. Uh, but I mark those up right in line, and then do the voice and video comments uh, using the tool in SpeedGrader, which is really powerful. 
um, some of the feedback from the folks in the MOOC was it was easier for the students to internalize the intent of the instructor when they could hear their voice. Because there's nothing worse than getting a paperback that's all marked up when you know you've spent countless hours and you've slaved over it, maybe even feel like you're not a great writer now, feel like I'm telling my own story, and, and it's killed you to produce this paper and then it's marked up all to death, right? So that internalization of that feedback can be extremely negative. If you can't hear the intent of the instructor telling you how much they feel like you're so close, there's a few changes you need to make, and they're so excited for your, you know, to polish it further. Um, that intent is really, that comes through when you can hear the, the individual. And then this was all about feedback in an online learning environment and the fact that you can't hear them, right? So it's all about who's engaging, who's getting what they need, who's finding that it's it's not getting them what they need. So it's it's this constant struggle in a digital space when you can't hear voices that kept coming up in the conversation. And this one I think is worth taking a, a quick moment. Um, this is Helen talking about how she applies this, and then we'll jump to the communication plan and we'll call quits. Until 1650. Perfect. So you have to practice. So we had a little chat before we went live. And, um, and I know Helen has a really good story to share. I, one of the things that when we're in it, when we're in the course and we're talking with people and, and they're sharing some of their concerns or, or aha moments as they go along, that's great. But I often wonder, how is this impacting the classroom? You know, is there, is there a takeaway? Does it change thinking or does it at least allow you to have that voice in the back of your head that makes you continually think differently? Um, so, Helen, maybe you could share an impact of practice story. A, a big one for me was the um, kind of pu the push in Human MOOC to do instructor video it, and putting your face, um, you know, in an online space. And the more the more I pushed myself to do it, the more comfortable I've become, you know, having these conversations. But ha having those conversations with my students, I said, I, I teach face-to-face, -face and I'm about to start a, um, an online course as well. But putting my face to feedback, for example, was a big, big push for me. And in the spring, I provided individual feedback to students' assignments, and I've just redone that with a, a course that I'm, I'm just wrapping up now. And one of my students, in face-to-face, mentioned how valuable the video, the feedback video was. She's been watching it over and over again just to make sure that she's addressing in the assignment everything that I, I mentioned, you know, that she could consider tweaking or consider doing or, or you know, things that, that um, could be improved in some way. So just it, that was for me the, the impact of the video, put, putting my face out there on video and, and using video to support student learning. Thanks, Helen. Helen was very brave because that, that's hard. That's probably the first piece of all of this that was kind of hard as I've talked to faculty over the years was getting comfortable seeing yourself on video because what you see is a reverse of yourself, right? You see your mirror image. Uh, your voice is different because when you're speaking, there's vibrations in your head so you hear your voice differently. So then who is this person that's looking at me that's telling me the same thing I just told to the camera? It's it's a little off-putting at first, but once you get comfortable with it, it can really be powerful. Um, okay, so here's the bonus item, and that's number seven, and that's the idea of this communication plan, and I mentioned to you at the very beginning, this is something that I'm starting to put together for myself. Um, it's, um, it's really helpful for me to start, as I'm getting to the end of the semester, to reflect back and say, could I have created some really structured announcements that then I could tweak or personalize each semester, but I could keep it in one space where I can use it and go back and continue to adapt to this as I go forward. So I'm actually starting to pull some of my messages from my announcement section in Canvas back into this document so that it becomes this living, breathing launch pad. So each one of these hyperlinks to a different Google document that has the message that I would drop in at that point in time in the course. So it becomes this kind of 
launch pad again. It looks like a lot of the other screenshots that I've shown you, right? Like Symbaloo and other things. It's just a way for me to visually find the pieces and parts of the different pieces. Did you share that? I'd be happy to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, if you want to know more, because you're moving to Canvas, and that all by itself is a lot to think about, taking a course on the Canvas Open Network, something that's free and available to you, could be really helpful. Even if you snack, like I said earlier, you just go and explore what other people are, how other people are using Canvas, that could be a really great opportunity for you guys to become more familiar with it. And it's just canvas.net is the URL for that. Uh, universities from all over the world put up free courses all the time, so there's always something to pick from. Might be in your topic of interest, might be in your discipline. Not that those would be two different things, but it could be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd say check that out. That's a really great resource. And then um, if you're not familiar with virtually connecting, virtually connecting is a way to attend a conference without paying the fees or showing up. Um, I just did a couple of virtually connecting sessions. Um, I was actually supposed to be at the one at OER 19, but I was on the other side of the country. Um, but I did one recently at ELI. And so what happens is there's this underground community of folks that go to these events, and they're the on-site <coughs> hosts, and they'll typically bring the keynote speaker or somebody into a Google Hangout, and you can watch these. And they're, they're all recorded, they're all available on virtually connecting. If you want some creative and innovative ideas, just go to this website and explore some of the archives because there are tons of hours of content. Um, and you can just listen and hear, explore ideas. I'd say this is probably the, the biggest treasure trove of learning that I like to go to from time to time to go explore new ideas. And then you can just click through these really quickly. Um, I know we're going to do some workshop time this afternoon. These are other ways that you could do particular activities to get um, folks excited. And then, of course, I, I didn't want to overwhelm you with the seven things, but just wanted you to find one thing that might resonate with you so you could try something new. So thank you very much. I know I went six or seven minutes over. Oh,